It is my great privilege to share this afternoon on two of my favorite saints, but I have to qualify my remarks because I approach this talk with greater trepidation than usually because what I'm doing here this afternoon, I have to sort of pretend to be something I'm not, and that is a church historian. I am by trade a professor of scripture, and so I am an amateur devotee of English Reformation history. And I have to say that I approach these two incredible characters, St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More, with much greater love and devotion than expertise and understanding. But for the last several months, I've had the privilege of immersing myself in their writings. And I don't bring all of these books up here to impress you, but for the purpose of enticing you to immerse yourself, at least dip your toes into the writings that I have had the opportunity to study. But I think it's especially appropriate that we gather to get today, on a Saturday before an important election, to consider two very important leaders, martyrs who represent for us the virtues that we need the Holy Spirit to reproduce in us and many others around us. St. John Fisher, a cardinal of the Catholic Church and Bishop of Rochester, was beheaded for his testimony to Christ and for the one church that he had established and maintained through the ages. He had once been King Henry's tutor and before that a counselor to Henry's father and grandfather. And yet that didn't prevent Henry from offering him up as an innocent martyr. Likewise, St. Thomas More, a layman, Chancellor of England, resigned his post to the ruin of his family, accepted hardship, and remained silent rather than to support Henry's divorce and claims to supremacy. Imprisoned in the Tower of London, subjected to psychological torture before he too was finally beheaded in July of 1535. These two figures, clergy and laity, are represented alike, and we members of the laity and perhaps some clergy are here as well. We need to study their lives and learn those lessons. I want to divide up my remarks in three steps. First, I would like to reflect upon these two saints and their historical background and their own life experience leading up to their martyrdoms. Second, I would like to focus upon how it was that both of them gained their strength from deep spiritual reading of sacred scripture and passed that along as a supernatural habit for all of us to learn. And then thirdly, I'd like to draw some practical applications for us today, similar to what Paul Thigpen did just a few minutes ago. As you know, it was the morning of June 22nd, 1535, that Bishop John Fisher who is not only Bishop of Rochester, but also Chancellor of Cambridge University, Cardinal of the Catholic Church, was beheaded on Tower Hill. The executioner not only beheaded him, but also, by orders of the king, stripped his decapitated corpse. There at the scaffold is a spectacle for all. These rites were dictated by the king in royal anger, rage, and then, of course, St. John Fisher's head was staked on London Bridge, where for two weeks crowds gathered to behold the countenance of this martyred bishop and how it seemed almost lifelike. Indeed, it was described as rosy. This aged man, whose mortal remains were treated with such contempt and irreverence, 30, 30 years old, Earlier, that same body had been tutoring this young boy, Henry VIII, at the request of the parents. And when we look at who it was that Henry had as a tutor, I think we have to really stop and marvel at the incredible grace of God. Because Henry VIII held John Fisher in the highest esteem for many years, as did all of England, indeed, all of Europe. For example, Cardinal Pohl reminisced once about returning from Europe to visit the king, his relative. And the question that the king asked Cardinal Pohl 
was if he had met anybody in Europe comparable to Fisher in scholarship and holiness. And Paul said no. Likewise, the ambassador for the Holy Roman Emperor commented upon how it was such a strange thing that Fisher would be arrested. He described this bishop as the most holy and learned prelate in all of Christendom. What a combination, both saint and scholar. It's no small achievement in those days because the great universities and the greatest learning of all took place on the continent, not on the island. In the northern Renaissance, not even in the hallowed halls of Cambridge. And yet, he possessed such a sparkling intellect and also a massive private library. And he devoted himself to study and prayer as much as he did to apostolic and pastoral work. He studied at Cambridge where he got all three degrees, the bachelor's, the master's, and the doctoral degree. One of his first books was published in the first decade of the sixth century before the Protestant Revolt, and it was a series of homilies, expositions of the seven penitential psalms, in which he declared his intention to promote among all, the, the, all of the Catholics in Britain a scripture-based spirituality, and also to advance greater use of the sacrament of confession. In fact, what was remarkable about these sermons was that they were published in the vernacular rather than in Latin, though he had published a great deal in Latin before and since. But this was for the rank and file, the ordinary faithful. After 1520, when the Reformation had finally reached England, Bishop Fisher became known as a one-man counter-reformation not only in his preaching and counsel, but also in his scholarship and refutation of Luther. People from all around the continent looked to him for arguments, for specific strategies, and they found no shortage in all of his writings and his preaching as well. Twenty-six works by him survive in print, though most of them are out of print, unfortunately. It was interesting to read about how widespread the opinion was that this man, the Bishop of Rochester, was considered to be more upright than any other Englishman and also more scholarly than any professor. Erasmus himself spoke to John Roycklin and said that Fisher is the best scholar of his nation and its most saintly prelate. One source that I read testifies that at the time of the English Reformation, when King Henry enacted the Oath of Supremacy, it was a widely held opinion that Bishop Fisher of Rochester was the only English bishop not to have a concubine. So Thomas More looked upon this man as a spiritual leader, a man distinguished for his wealth of learning and above all for his holiness of life. That's how he put it. More also learned a lot from his defense of the primacy of the Pope and the Eucharist and the sacraments. But what especially impressed Moore and others who came to the defense of the faith in England was how it was that Bishop Fisher rendered the matters very clear, especially from the Gospels, from the Acts of the Apostles, and particularly, Moore added, from the whole body of the Old Testament, not to mention the, the Holy Fathers, both Latin and Greek. So it was that we have a saint and a scholar, but he was in the minority, and he never wrote any sort of biblical theology of bad bishops. Instead, what he wrote was a treatise on the priesthood. I want to recommend this to you before anything else. It's a defense of the priesthood by Cardinal Fisher. It's still in print. I have an old out-of-print edition. But what amazed me as I worked through this was his scholarship. Not only the Greek fathers in the East, but the Latin fathers of the West, the Old Testament and the New Testament, as well as many rabbinic sources down through the ages. I remember years ago coming across the, the argument from Scripture in the book of Hebrews for the royal priesthood of Melchizedek and how that stands as the model, the paradigm for the covenant, the new covenant priesthood.
Well, I discovered these last few months how I was reinventing the wheel. And not only that, but the bread and the wine offered by Melchizedek, being the example of the great sacrifice of thanksgiving, in Hebrew, the todah meal. In my book, The Lamb's Supper, I found an obscure source from ancient rabbinic writings, and I cited it, that in the coming messianic age, all the animal sacrifices was, would cease, only the todah would continue forever. That is the sacrifice that the rabbis recognized as most pleasing to God, the sacrifice of thanksgiving consisting of unleavened bread and unleavened wine, uh, unleavened bread and wine. What Fisher did was to anticipate this by finding five rabbinic sources that said the same thing. <laughs> he was well aware of the fact that spanning the Old and New Testaments was more than enough evidence to establish the biblical truth of Christ's real presence in the Holy Eucharist and the new covenant sacrifice of the new covenant high priest as the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. I also found something else curious about Bishop Fisher. He was Bishop of Rochester for many years, but his prestige seemed to exceed the littleness of this particular see. And so he was approached on two occasions and offered first the Bishop of the Episcopacy of Lincoln and then the Diocese of Eli. He urged, he, he declined the both. In fact, in his urgings, he said that he was unwilling as he put it, to divorce his poor old wife of Rochester for any rich widow in England. <laughs> he considered his bond to the diocese to be a nuptial one, a marital covenant, and it was that which his ring represented. I have a friend of mine in Rome who's doing a doctoral dissertation on the significance of the Episcopal ring and how it symbolizes marital fidelity and commitment and why it is that bishops should not see their positions as occasions for upward ecclesial mobility, moving from one small diocese to a bigger, and then finally an archdiocese. This is exactly the way that Bishop Fisher thought without having to think very much about it. And yet the hatred of the king for this saint was implacable. And so it was that he was uh, arrested. He was first summoned. The one thing that enraged Henry the most about Bishop Fisher's preaching was the comparison that he made between himself and John the Baptist. For John the Baptist also had a corrupt king who had entered into a corrupt marital arrangement, forcing a divorce, and it cost him his head. And Fisher seemed to have an intimation that it might do so again. And so he referred to himself, as John the Baptist did, as a friend of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, committed to the bride of Christ, the Catholic Church. And this is exactly where Bishop Fisher's meditations ended up in 1534, as he was preaching up until the time of his arrest. When Pope Paul III was appointed the successor, and took the see of Peter, he thought that he had found a strategy to preserve Bishop Fisher, and that was to confer upon him, even though the bishop of a small diocese, the venerable dignity of becoming a cardinal. And so he did. And in a way, the pope did confer a new honor upon St. John Fisher. In fact, it made Henry execute him all the more speedily. Henry allegedly joked about the cardinal's hat, quote, that whensoever it cometh, it shall wear it. He shall wear it upon his shoulders. For head he shall have none to set it upon. That's royal humor. Another writer of the time describes how Henry prohibited the cardinal's hat to be brought into England, declaring instead that he would send the head to Rome instead. This is the situation that St. John Fisher faced upon his arrest, his trial, and his execution. But what I liked most about all of the, the reading was the account of how he, awoke, how he woke up the morning of his martyrdom. And he surprised his servant, who had attended to him for years. 
by taking off something he had never removed, and that was his hair shirt. And instead, for the occasion, he put on his very best clothes. When his servant asked him why, Fisher explained that his wedding day had arrived, and it deserved such solemnity. And so even though he was too weak to walk to the trial, he suddenly had a surge of energy that the witnesses beheld as he stepped up to the scaffold. As soon as he came in sight of the place where he was to be conqueror in this glorious context, he said, now my feet must do their duty, for I have but a little way to go. And then having reached the place where he was to offer his life as a living sacrifice, he was witnessed by all to lift his eyes to heaven, and he began to recite the Te Deum Laudamus. So it was, England had a great gift from heaven, the blood of the martyrs, beginning with St. John Fisher. Two weeks later, the layman, the former chancellor, St. Thomas More, followed. And we've already heard a fair bit about St. Thomas More. I don't want to go into the details of his life because I suspect I will be repeating what most of us have enjoyed by repeated watchings of A Man for All Seasons. Just as a tangent, I, uh, I recall vividly as a youngster growing up in Bethel Park outside of Pittsburgh, my next door neighbors were devout Catholics and they wouldn't allow their son, my best friend, into my house. That was back before Vatican II. In fact, the only time Tommy was allowed in was to watch the funeral mass for John F. Kennedy, which I was watching from the sofa, hanging my head upside down because I had walking pneumonia. I think his parents were hoping that this young lad would be an apostle and a faithful witness. Just a few months, well, a few years later, I received an invitation from my Catholic neighbors to see the very first movie that was to be shown at the brand new movie theater at South Hills Village. It was right across the street from St. Thomas More Parish, and it was a man for all seasons. And I didn't comprehend a single moment of that movie. All I can remember from that childhood experience was the ax that fell and the darkness that followed. And I whispered, what happened? And Tommy replied, he lost his head. I spent months trying to figure out why. <laughs> In fact, I could say I spent years trying to figure out why, as a Protestant, why a man would waste such a brilliant mind on a cause that seems so wrong and contrary to Scripture. He is best known, of course, for a writing that came out very, very early, Utopia, which scholars still debate today. But shortly after the Reformation began, St. Thomas More published the Responsio Ad Lutherum, which appeared as volume five in the massive Yale collection of the collected works of St. Thomas More. In modern English translation, after spending a few weeks in this, I must say that it reads a lot like the website for Catholic Answers. <laughs> it sounds like Carl Keating or Pat Madrid. You have arguments from scripture for the papacy, for the Eucharist, for all seven sacraments, for indulgences, for purgatory, and on down. It's remarkable to see how we've been recycling these arguments from Scripture and also from the fathers and the examples of the martyrs from which he draws. It is compelling indeed, not only for us today, but for many of his contemporaries, including the young king, Henry VIII, who worked closely with Thomas More and others in his own defense of the seven sacraments, as you know, King Henry was awarded by the Pope the title Defensor Fidei, Defender of the Faith, a title, somewhat ironically, the English crown clings to to this very day. But what I found in St. Thomas More is the same thing I found in St. John Fisher, and that is Thomas More was a man of his word, not only his own word, but God's word. He immersed himself in scripture and his family in devotions drawn from the Old and New Testaments, as well as the example and writings of the fathers and the martyrs. What I also discovered was an expert, a sort of theologian, a scholar, one that is hard to classify, 
Is he a historian? Is he a theologian? Or was he a biblical exegete? Or perhaps D, all of the above? Because back then, before the specialization that has set in today, saints like Moore, who were also scholars, were immersed in all things pertaining to Christ, the Old and New Testaments, the patristic and medieval writings, the doctors and saints, and also the official church teaching of the magisterium. It's amazing for me to experience the mind of St. Thomas More, not only in this writing, but especially in the last writings that came from his pen shortly before his death. I just want to give a few examples from this last work of his entitled The Sadness of Christ, which fortunately has been brought back into print from Scepter Press. Like Fisher, his exegesis was built upon a very close reading of the literal sense, as he puts it. He brings in backgrounds such as the Jewish customs relating to the Passover, there in the final celebration of our Lord with his disciples in the upper room. He even draws from the historical background and Roman custom of Peter's use of the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. He also understood the analogy of faith bringing to bear the church's doctrines for exegeting the text of the Gospels. Like Fisher, he also understood that scripture was to be read both literally and spiritually. He said, and I quote, the words of Holy Scripture are not tied to one sense only, the literal, but from them we also draw spiritual riches. He also writes, no one's body, I think, is so fully pervaded by his soul as the letter of Scripture is pervaded by the spiritual mysteries. His description of the physical and emotional torment and anguish of our Lord has no rival, except perhaps the opening scene in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. But Moore sees something more than physical suffering and emotional anguish. He is discovering in his writings, in his own reading of Scripture, what he describes as the spiritual meaning of Christ's agony. He made himself weak for the sake of the weak, he writes. I want to quote a few passages from this. Jesus is saying, as it were, trust me, I conquered the world, and yet I suffered immeasurably more from fear. I was sadder and more afflicted with weariness, more horrified at the prospect of such cruel suffering, drawing eagerly nearer and nearer. But you, my timorous and feeble little sheep, be content to have me alone as your shepherd. Follow my leadership. If you do not trust yourself, place your trust in me. See, I am walking ahead of you along this fearful road. Take hold of the border of my garment, and you will fear, you will fear, I'm sorry, you will feel the power going out from me, and you will receive the strength that you need. For the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come, which will be revealed in you. And he goes on. What's most remarkable about this particular book this last work of his, is that it was written in the Tower of London while awaiting execution. He wasn't writing apologetics anymore, nor was he developing various drafts of his own personal defense. Instead, what he, medita what he meditated upon in prayer, what he wrote and edited in time for his own execution, was a profound contemplation of the literal sense of Jesus' own sufferings, as described in the Gospels, in order to impart the spiritual meaning for Christ's body in his own day. In fact, he goes on to say, Although nothing can contribute more effectively to salvation and to the implanting of every sort of virtue in the Christian breast than pious and fervent meditation on the successive events of Christ's passion, still, it would certainly be not unprofitable to take the story of that time when the apostles were sleeping as the Son of Man was being betrayed and to apply it as a mysterious image of future times. And that's exactly what he was doing. Because he goes on to describe how it was in Jesus' day that he instituted the Eucharist in the context of the Passover, fulfilling the old, and ratifying the new, taking from the twelve the three who were closest to the Garden of Gethsemane. St. Thomas More describes how the three followed Jesus 
And when Jesus drew further away from them, they became sluggish and sleepy. He returned to them repeatedly to tell them to watch and pray with him. But instead, they fell back asleep. St. Thomas More describes how it is that Jesus plunged himself into sadness. He allowed himself to feel, to, to, to experience the depth of human emotion. He also notices that there were saints in the early church who faced suffering, torture, and death who didn't seem to shrink back with so much fear and sorrow. He asked the question, why then does our Lord do so? As the shepherd of the sheep who knows what will befall each and every one of them, Moore explains how the good shepherd goes out of his way to suffer the sadness and fear that that one would feel as he lost from the 99. So the shepherd plunged himself into the deepest human sorrow as well as infinite divine love. It's interesting to see how a saint facing martyrdom doesn't see any contradiction in that holy merriment that uh, Paul Thigpen spoke about, and yet at the same time, the deep sadness. The sadness that Moore felt was because of what the mystical body of Christ was undergoing. I really want to encourage you to pick up a copy of The Sadness of Christ, because I am convinced we can draw lessons from it today in our own time that are going to be very valuable for us personally and for others as well. I'm going to paraphrase about 50 or 60 pages just because I don't have the time to work through all of the quoted materials that I have marked off in The Sadness of Christ. First of all, more, ex more shows how it would have been tempting for the disciples to try to stay there in Palm Sunday. Think about it. The more I meditated upon the Gospels and thinking Moore's thoughts after him, the more I realized how difficult it would have been for the disciples to follow our Lord following that Sunday. Peter himself must have wondered, Lord, why didn't we just kind of stop there when thousands of people acknowledge you as the conquering king coming into the royal city? Why didn't we just kind of, you know, enjoy the moment? Why did you have to just suddenly walk into the temple and cleanse it? Couldn't that have waited a few weeks? You know, couldn't we have, you know, worked it out so as to ride the wave of popularity and in that way secure thousands of more conversions and lots more support? And yet, our Lord didn't understand his mission in those terms. It wasn't to establish his own kingship here on earth. It was to offer the sacrifice of his high priesthood instead. And so he proceeded immediately into the temple and cleansed it, offending the officials, causing them to intensify their plans to conspire to execute our Lord. And then in the upper room, taking bread, he gave thanks and praise. The more I meditated upon Moore's meditations, the more it startles me you know, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks and praise, he took the bread and broke it. Now, why did Jesus give his heavenly Father thanks and praise? For the success of the last Sunday, all of the crowds screaming with delight at the coming king? No. Knowing that he was to be betrayed and executed, he gave thanks anyway, not with a spirit of stoic resignation, but with a firm and resolute desire to offer his life in divine love as a holy sacrifice. Something that the 12 disciples couldn't understand then any better than we sometimes understand it today. And so, after the supper, when the four of them went into the garden of Gethsemane, more sets the scene in such profound terms because Jesus goes off and prays in the great agony in the garden of Gethsemane, experiencing the fear that is human, the sadness as well. And yet at the same time, encouraging his disciples and preparing them not only for what would follow that evening, but what would follow at the end of the lives of those disciples. So it was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is arrested. And at that point, Moore shows 
how Peter springs to life, draws his sword, and takes a swing. There's a very humorous passage where more reflects upon what it was that Peter was aiming at. Do you really think he was aiming for the ear? <laughs> no, Peter, though an infallible pope, was a fallible swordsman. <laughs> And how ironic it was that the last miracle that our Lord performs is to undo the misspent zeal of the Prince of the Apostles. And so it is that when we don't enter into the anguish and deep prayer of our Lord, we won't comprehend the hour when it arrives. We won't be able to do what Our Lady did, and that is to give quiet and holy consent to the self-offering and sufferings of her Son, our Savior. But that's precisely what they needed to do, to watch and pray, lest they fall into temptation. Moore doesn't dwell upon the temptations. He doesn't dwell upon Peter's failings. Instead, he just draws the lessons for us today. That if Jesus prayed for Simon and yet assured him that he would fall, can you imagine what would have happened if he hadn't prayed? Think about that. Simon was so sure that he wouldn't betray, he wouldn't deny our Lord, and yet our Lord knew that he would. And he adds, Simon, I have prayed for you, so when you repent, return and strengthen the brethren. I am convinced that we can derive some practical lessons today, because I think that there are many Palm Sunday Catholics today who want to freeze frame the success of the church in the 30s and 40s, who simply want to go back to Bing Crosby and the Bells of St. Mary, who see that as the golden age, who really believe that this is what the church ought to be in every age. And I think St. Thomas More would point us back to the Gospels and say, that's a Palm Sunday moment. They never last for long. We like it when large numbers come out, when many vocations are there, when the popularity surges, when Christ's social kingship is recognized and acknowledged by politicians and by those within the spiritual structures of the church as well. And yet more has shown us again and again just what he experienced himself, those things never last, nor was it God's intention for them to do so. For this earth is not the primary place where Christ establishes his kingdom. It's a heavenly kingdom that is extended to earth by the power of the Spirit, through the seven sacraments. But what the seven sacraments really show us is that the earth is a battlefield, or even better, an altar that we must, we must approach and give consent to holy sacrifice, daily mortification, self-denial. But as Paul Thigpen reminded us, quite possibly in our own lifetime, something that we haven't seen for centuries here in North America and that is the blood of the martyrs. The earth is a battlefield for spiritual warfare, but even more, it is an altar where we have an opportunity to offer a holy sacrifice. This doesn't mean that we trivialize Palm Sunday. This doesn't mean that we don't strive for large numbers in many vocations and for the public recognition of Christ's kingship. It's simply the case that we should not ever expect it all to rest there. I think that there are also people who are what we could characterize as Good Friday Catholics. That is, those who really expect the worst and come to the cross and see the rejection, the suffering, and how only a tiny minority are left, Our Lady, the beloved disciple, and the other women there. You know, I, 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 I'm reminded of of, of some Catholics who have been described as Amish Catholics. They're isolationists. They only expect the church to suffer and to be persecuted. And once again, we shouldn't trivialize that. That insight is valuable for us. But I think we have to recognize that between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, we have the Holy Eucharist. We have Holy Thursday. We have the Garden of Gethsemane. We have the Blessed Sacrament that is given to us not only to celebrate the redemption of the world by the Most High King and our Heavenly High Priest, but also to empower ourselves, to equip ourselves, to prepare ourselves to live out the mystery that we celebrate in the Mass 
if necessary, even through holy martyrdom. This is the only thing that can lead to the joy of Easter Sunday. In the great Paschal mystery of Jesus' self-offering, we have a revelation of what God has willed for Christ's body to pass through, not only in the first century, but also in the 21st century. In the first century, the body of Christ, the individual body, went through a time of great celebration and recognition. And then, through a time of, of, mis of misunderstanding, incomprehension, misrepresentation, slander, the body of Christ was arrested. It was tried. It was sentenced to die. And so it did. And then the joy and the glory of the resurrection was manifest. We can't help but learn from St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More that this is not only the literal sense and the historical truth of what Christ's body underwent, it's also the deeper spiritual significance for us of what his mystical body must still undergo. We are heirs with Christ, co-heirs, as Paul reminds us in Romans 8. But as St. Thomas More adds, verse 17 says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. Romans 8, 17 promises us the glory of our inheritance, but on the condition of our own consent to sacrificial suffering. Christ-like love. Moore goes on to explain how it is that Paul anticipates our, our, our response. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul states that the sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory. Why would Paul say that? Because once we hear that the only way we can pass in the glory is if we pass through suffering, then suddenly we begin to, you know, analyze the costs and the benefits. And Paul says that the costs aren't even worth comparing to the glory that awaits us. But still we know from experience how it is that we respond when we face suffering. And so we shrink, we run, we flee, we avoid it at all costs. And St. Paul goes on in verses 19 and following, and Thomas More expounds this so well, that all of creation has been subjected to futility. In other words, there's no place to run, there's nowhere to hide. You're going to suffer no matter where you go. God is going to hunt us down like the hound of heaven. Why? Not to get even with vindictive vengeance, but to apply the medicine of suffering to those children who are destined for glory, but who can only attain the glory to the extent that the, the Holy Spirit reproduces in us not only Christ's obedience, but also his passion, death, and resurrection. And so Paul says it's not only incomparable, the glory compared to the suffering, but the suffering is unavoidable. And then, drawing from the very prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and also from Paul's description in Romans 8, St. Paul faces the fact that many people don't even know how to pray as they ought, especially when they face the prospect of suffering. And so what does Paul do? He offers his readers assurance that when the hour comes that the Spirit is reproducing Christ's own suffering in us, we who do not know how to pray as we ought will be empowered by the Spirit who will intercede with sighs and groans too deep for words. What Moore points out, what St. Paul teaches, is that in the hour of suffering, when we can't even get out a Hail Mary or an Our Father, our groans and our sighs, coupled with our consent, become the most profound and articulate prayers that the Spirit prays on our behalf in order to see us through the trial of that hour. You see, Christ does not exempt us from suffering. Christ's death does not spare us, but it prepares us to enter into the same sacrifice. Moore also explains how it is that love is what transforms suffering into a holy sacrifice. It isn't just simply suffering that has any redemptive value. It isn't because Christ suffered so much that he redeemed the world. It's because he loved us with an infinite divine love that that love transformed human suffering into the most perfect and holy sacrifice. And that's what we receive in every Holy Eucharist to prepare ourselves to reproduce what Christ has done for us.
This is not a substitutionary act the way Luther taught. That Christ did it so we don't have to. This is a representative act, as St. Thomas More explains it. That Christ did it as a representative to empower us to do what we can never do apart from him. And he represents in us by the Spirit, as members of his mystical body, as arms and legs and eyes and ears, the same obedience, the same suffering, and the same resurrection glory that he experienced in himself. For our sake, then, he allowed himself to be plunged into the depth of his human soul, into this anguish, into this sadness, to console us, the most fearful and timorous saint who is called to suffer, Jesus has stooped down to the lowest depths to help the sinner. And in the process, he has gained for us the Holy Spirit and enabled us to experience what we've been hearing about all weekend. Martyrs who suffer much because they love much, but not just love our Lord, but love even their persecutors. Listen to another quote from St. Thomas More as he faced his accusers on the day and the hour that he was sentenced to die. My lords, he said, St. Paul witnessed the stoning of St. Stephen and acquiesced with his persecutors when he volunteered to keep the capes of his tormentors while they stoned Stephen to death. Yet they are together in heaven, St. Stephen and Paul. And together they will always be. I too hope and pray that although your lordships have been my accusers here today on earth, we may meet again happily in heaven. May God preserve his majesty, the king, and inspire him, too, with wisdom. That is the love of Christ reproduced in the soul of a saint to not only accept the martyr's crown and the drink from the cup, but also to extend mercy and forgiveness and a prayer for the salvation of his tormentors and executioners. I want to conclude by stating my opinion that these two men could not have entered into this great hour of suffering if they had not spent many, many hours in study and prayer. I'm not suggesting that, this, that the level of scripture scholarship attained by St. John Fisher and to an extent also by St. Thomas More is a prerequisite for the martyr's crown. Far from it. These days, we can see ample evidence that scripture scholarship often drives people away from such holiness. But when it's done with proper and holy dispositions, we see in these two great men how it is that allowing our minds and hearts to soak in sacred scripture, accompanied by prayer, we enter into an, a, a lifetime of intimate dialogue and friendship with our Lord, as St. Thomas More himself describes it. A trusting openness of our heart to receive whatever he wills. This practice is something that is there not only for bishops and for chancellors and martyrs, but for all of the faithful. Indeed, just recently, Pope Benedict stated the following. I would like in particular to recall and recommend the ancient tradition of Lexio Divina, that is a contemplative reading of scripture for its divine meaning. The diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied by prayer is what brings about that intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God who is speaking and in praying responds to him with trusting openness of heart. Benedict concludes, if it is effectively promoted, this practice will bring to the church, I am convinced of it, a new spiritual springtime. And he doesn't guarantee with that statement, sustaining a Palm Sunday. No, it was springtime that the Passover was celebrated. It was springtime that the body of Christ was executed. But it's also springtime in which Jesus was resurrected. So as we meditate upon the Gospels, and we see that the mystical body of Christ is called upon to suffer the same sorts of humiliations and agonies today that the individual body of our Lord underwent. It's only by this prayerful soaking in scripture that we can really comprehend and respond with faithful consent. And then in speaking to bishops, Pope Benedict wrote again, quote, not to live Christianity according to the letter only. We must go beyond the letter. Our present reality, 
towards the Lord who speaks to us from heaven, and hence to union with God, the eternal trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How can we do this? We can do so by reading sacred scripture in which Christ's thoughts are the word. They speak to us. In this sense, we must practice Lexio Divina. We must grasp Christ's way of thinking, Christ's way of reading scripture. We must learn to think with Christ, to think Christ's thoughts after him and thus to feel his sentiments and to be able to convey Christ's thinking to others. I would add to what Paul Thigpen said that it is my firm conviction that in my lifetime most likely, but certainly within the lifetime of my own six children, we will see martyrs' blood spilled in North America. And this is not in spite of God's love for us, but because of it. We've gone for centuries without that special grace. We have many other graces for which we ought to be grateful. But if, in fact, we enter into that hour of trial, we must read the Gospels, we must pray the Gospels, but we also must emulate our Lord and the saints like Fisher and more. We must watch and pray, and we must give consent in allowing Christ to reproduce his glory in us by calling us to undergo the Paschal mystery, to endure suffering with great hope, and to recognize that once we get to heaven and we'll look back, we'll be ashamed to have been comparing the price of suffering to the eternal weight of glory. Thank you.